All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Alex Cron, and I am BPOC's Digital Operations and Collections Information Analyst. Here with me today, I have BPOC's CEO, Nick Honeyset, and our Consulting Executive Advisor and pres President of Stimler Advantage, Neil Stimler, as my co-hosts. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and welcome to the fourth episode of BPOC's Dreaming of Digital Asset Management. Today, we have invited Peter Adamczyk from Ithaca, Virginia Poundstone from the Cur Cur Ugh, Curationist Project at the Megahertz Foundation, and Alexis Rossi from Internet Archive to talk with us about digital preservation, uh, making your digital assets more accessible, and the benefits of working with third-party organizations to make your collections information and digital assets more accessible to larger communities. Uh, now, before I introduce our guest speakers, I want to mention that we will open our discussion up for a Q&A about 10 to 15 minutes before the end. So please put any questions that you have in the Q&A section. Uh, feel free to comment and discuss during uh, the, the discussion um, in the chat. Today's session is being recorded. Uh, if you're having difficulty with the transcription service, please feel free to reach out to me directly and let me know. Now for our speakers. Peter is the Director of Content Data Governance at Ithaca, home to JSTOR and ArtStore, previously a Program Manager at the Google, Institute, the Google Cultural Institute, a librarian and computer scientist. He started his work in museums with the digital media team at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Next, we have Virginia as the Deputy, or as the Director of Product and Content Virginia leads the product and content strategy and teams for the open access art and cultural heritage project. Prior to joining the Megahertz Foundation, she was an art educator at Parsons School of Design, Maryland Institute College of Art, and Columbia University School of the Arts. Last and absolutely certainly not least, we have Alexis as the director of media and access. Alexis manages the digital collections of the Internet Archive. From 2006 to 2008, Alexis founded and launched openlibrary.org as well as working on the Open Content Alliance. From 2009 to 2015, Alexis managed mass web crawling projects and the, the Internet Archives Wayback Machine. Some of her current projects include 78 RPM digitization, radio, television, and podcast archiving, and large scale metadata improvement and linking. Thank you all three of you for being here today. Really appreciate you participating in our, our webinar series. Um, we'll start off with asking that each of you introduce your organization, the kind of work that you do, how your organization typically engages with cultural institutions, the benefits of working with your organization and making collection images and information more widely accessible. And then it, it, feel free to talk about one or two uh, of your successful projects that you have experienced challenges, what that was, that project looked like. Um, why don't we go ahead and start with Alexis and then we'll hand it over to Peter and then Virginia. Great, thank you. Hi everybody. Um, <clears throat> I have COVID so there's gonna be like possibly a little bit of coughing and I will apologize uh, for that in advance. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, the Internet Archive is a digital library. We were founded in 1996. Our original mission was to archive the internet, which is why we're called the Internet Archive. Um, and our first product was the Wayback Machine, which is an archive of the internet. Um, but soon thereafter, we kind of went, oh gee, um, the rest of this stuff doesn't seem to be making it online into an accessible form. Um, and so we started doing a lot of other stuff as well, um, digitizing books, uh, recording television news, um, you know, uh, archiving movies and software and all of these other things that you can now use the Internet Archive for. Um, our mission is universal access to all knowledge. So the idea is to try to make it so that anyone with access to the Internet can get information that you might get in a local library, um, plus more like like the Internet Archive uh, Wayback Machine. Um, so generally speaking, we, uh, we do work on our own behalf, um, so uh, increasing the collections of books, crawling the web, that kind of thing, but we also do a lot of work with institutions and with general end users. So um, general end users can just press upload on our website anytime they want. You can do it right now while I'm talking. Please don't do it while I'm talking, but um, <laughs> you can if you'd like. 
Um, with organizations, we tend to either, they press that upload button and then we find out about it later, which is totally fine. Um, or they can uh, contact us and we can help them create collections, figure out how to mesh their metadata in with what's on the archive already, um, you know, help them with bulk uploading. Uh, we have a lot of tools available for people um, to use and, and do that. You actually don't even have to talk to us if you don't want to. You can just go ahead and do it. We have APIs uh, available for that. The only thing you need us for really is to make a collection. Now that's if you want everything to be kind of openly available, which is our reason for existing in the world. So uh, for us, we do all of that for free, uh, as long as you want everything to be available. Um, if you don't want things to be available um, or you want some more fine-grained controls over where things are stored um, or how often fixity checking happens or things like that, um, we do have a pilot project called Vault uh, that is coming out probably at the end of this year or early next year. Uh, it is in pilot right now though, so you can get information about that. Um, and that is a paid service, a uh, digital preservation service. Other things that we do for partners, um, we scan books for partners and that we've done that for hundreds of libraries and other institutions uh, over the years. And we also archive the internet um, on behalf of partners. So we have an archiveit.org service um, that does that for you. You sign up for an account, you tell us what to crawl and when to crawl it, and we crawl it for you. So there's a bunch of different ways. We do other digitization. We mainly do that on our own behalf, like for 78s uh, and LPs. We can work with your digitizer. Um, we do that a lot. Uh, people who uh, are getting things digitized uh, at somewhere else, um, we can work straight with the digitizer to help back things up on the archive. I think one of the main benefits of putting things in the archive is that keeping these digital files alive and accessible for the very, very long term is exactly why we exist. That is the main reason why we exist. So um, that is a huge amount of work um, and it is a huge amount of expense for people whose entire life goal is not that. <laughs> so um, if you need a kind of safe, secure home for another copy of your stuff, lots of copies keep stuff safe, right? Um, we're a good place to do that. And again, you can do that with no charge, um, assuming there's a reasonable level of access to the public. Um, let's see. So I think that's probably a lot of the benefits other than because we are a nonprofit and we are very library values kind of oriented. We respect user privacy as much as we possibly can. Um, we try not to keep IPs, for example. Um, we run our own data centers, so your stuff and your users' information never goes to like a corporate cloud uh, somewhere, um, that kind of thing. And um, you can store any metadata with us, which is great. Uh, so depending on what your metadata is, uh, we have a very, very flexible system. We can uh, map yours onto ours. We can store your metadata in your own metadata files additionally inside the items that you create. Um, so it does tend to be a pretty good uh, way to store things for the long term. Um, so I'm going to show a couple of examples that I thought might be helpful for people, just if you're thinking about how to let's see. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Yes. Um, okay, so a couple of examples. California Revealed uh, is um, a big deal here in California, uh, and they worked with um, about 350 libraries around the state, I believe, to digitize materials. And then one of the things that California Revealed did was they also uploaded copies to us. So all of the materials from those 350 um, libraries are on the archive already. Again, this is a, you know, no money changed hands kind of project. And um, when you have a collection here, uh, if you go to the About tab here, you can see more about the collection uh, and when it was created. This is in 2011. Um, and you get statistics. So uh, 3 million, uh, 3.2 million downloads of things in this collection so far. Uh, you do get some information about where people are, where they're accessing things. This is the last 30 days. So it, we do have more information than that, and we have an API that you can use to get it out. But if you go look at one of the actual libraries, take 
Glendale. Uh, they have about 5,000 items. Uh, looks like they started uploading about five years ago. And uh, this is a book um, or text that they did. I think uh, one of the big pluses of the archive is that we have about, uh, I think it's about 1.6 million users every day, unique users. And uh, this, I don't think that this 1923 city directory probably has been pulled off the shelf 2,300 times uh, in the last five years in the physical library where this lives. So that it, things on the archive tend to get a lot of, um, a lot more use uh, than they might otherwise. So if that is um, in line with your collection desires, that's um, probably useful. Uh, the Cleveland Art Museum um, is also a, a good example. This one for us, because we're, um, we kind of came late to the images game a little bit. Uh, so we started in, uh, let's see, we actually, I think the Metropolitan Museum of Art was probably the first one that we had. Um, but I do love Cleveland. That's a more recent one. They're still uploading today. And uh, one of the challenges we had to overcome with this one was that uh, the museums wanted, let's see, let's look at an actual um, item. The museum uh, had metadata that didn't fit exactly onto ours. And uh, one of the things that we worked on them, uh, worked with them on, excuse me, uh, was figuring out how to store that and how to store it in a way that was the same as the Metropolitan Museum of Art, right? So um, medium is not something that we had ever used before, for example. Um, so the nice thing about how flexible metadata storage is on the archive is I can now search for medium ceramic in the Cleveland Art Museum. And even though this is not one of our commonly used metadata fields, every metadata field is indexed in the search engine, so you can still do a fielded search, uh, which is fantastic. And you can do that same fielded search across the entire website. And now you see almost 3,000 things. And you're seeing stuff from Cleveland and from the Metropolitan Museum of Art that both have that. So that is one of the things that we love doing with um, organizations, figuring out how to make their metadata very useful on the website. Um, a couple of other things to show. Um, I did mention Archive It. Oh gosh, I need to get this thing out of the way. There we go. Um, Archive It is how uh, we can help you um, get web resources. So in some cases that might be websites, it might just be um, PDFs from a government organization or things like that, but things that exist on the web that you have a reason to collect for your organization. Um, Archive It is an incredibly good way to do that. Archive It also runs the Vault service, the Digital Preservation Service. So they're the ones that you would talk to about that. And um, if you are looking to do some general uh, archiving, we have a whole lot of APIs and a whole lot of uh, information about how to use them. So um, this gives you kind of an idea of how things are structured. The metadata schema is located right here. The command line tool uh, is what you would use to upload things, including there's bulk uploading that this sounds difficult, I know, like if you're not a programmer, I'm not a programmer. Uh, but once you get this set up, it's actually really easy. You put your metadata into a spreadsheet and you type in a one line command and you press go, basically. So it's, uh, it's a lot easier than it seems. There's also a views API, uh, which you'll see over here. And views are what we, we call uh, the interactions with the items, whether it's downloads or flipping pages in a book or anything like that. So that's kind of a general overview of the archive and um, ways that you might wanna work with us. I am happy to answer questions later on. Thanks. Thank you, Alexis. Now we'll hand it over to Peter. Uh, yeah, we're we're a much more modest organization than the Internet Archive. <laughs> uh, we just want to focus on every piece of scholarly literature in the world ever written. That's pretty much it. So you guys keep the internet, and we'll do all the paper stuff. Is pretty much the idea. Um, so again, started about twenty years ago, both Art Store and JSTOR. Um, the initial impetus was really around physical storage space in libraries uh, that people were running out of room and keeping a lot of backfile journals. 
that um, the material wouldn't be circulating and there would always be more scholarship being published and the libraries were running out of room, uh, both in terms of their slide libraries and, and the how to keep them organized as well as the physical space in their circulating library spaces. So um, a lot of the back files of journals um, were being digitized and individually in the individual pockets. And at the time, various funders were helping those institutions, those libraries, and in some cases, archives and museums maintain that material, but there wasn't any place um, yet uh, that was kind of providing all of it for a scholarly audience and for the education sector. And that's where JSTOR and ArtStore kind of came in um, to focus on that particular issue. Um, we work with publishers um, to provide kind of a moving window of um, past uh, runs of print runs of journals um, to an audience of roughly well over 10,000 educational institutions around the world. Um, we are a nonprofit. We uh, do as much of the work as we can at uh, little to no cost to the institutions that are participating and um, to try to kind of expand the kinds of material that we have online. We've been working on um, various projects that I'll show in a second, but um, it, largely it's been the secondary literature for the mostly books and journals, but increasingly we're working over the last five years or so with image collections since Art Store came back into the Ithaca fold, um, as well as what we're calling kind of community collections, kind of very similar uh, to the Internet Archive. We have a lot of the same uh, partners trying to reach a, a slightly different audience um, through the J store platform. So um, working with libraries and archives that might have digitized content that for one reason or another might not be able to share it with the Internet Archive or don't have a place for it um, in their own uh, digital asset management systems or their orphaned collections, for lack of a better term, even on their own campus. And they're trying to find a way to make sure that the scholars that are interested in that material have a place that they can go um, and find that content. Um, and really, that's the, the big focus when working with Ithaca is, is trying to reach that um, scholarly audience. The fact that faculty and students are using it for teaching, um, there's quite a bit of traffic that comes also to, uh, to JSTOR. And the, just yesterday, we were talking about um, the kind of organic search we get from Google, where even if that content might live somewhere else, um, that PDF or that copy of that article might live somewhere else on uh, the faculty website or something like that, the JSTOR article sometimes comes up higher and whether or not that's always a good thing and trying to um, balance the, the needs of all of the cultural institutions that, and providers that work with us as well as the, the people that are trying to find it all in one spot. Um, I'll share my screen as well. I'll see if I can show you a couple of Pull this up. So, of course, um, just thought metadata would be a good term uh, to look for. The kinds of things that we have currently journals, book chapters, research reports, as well as a lot of images and additional material coming from primary sources. Collections, we've, over the last two years or so, we've added about 1,300 or so institutions, I want to say, um, that have added a lot of uh, material. We work in a very similar way um, to Internet Archive, where we can take any number of multi, uh, metadata formats. Media, we've been mostly working with PDFs and image formats. Um, we're starting to, um, and we have some legacy audio and video collections, but we just run into them much less frequently. Um, so the digitizations are, are a little bit more varied and we haven't seen um, as many of the institutions uh, come to us with that. The Metropolitan Museum of Art will work with anybody. Um, so, you know, they threw up all their stuff up here too. Um, and it, again, it was a bit of a challenge. It always is with the metadata. I'm sure this will come up again and again. The standards uh, that people follow really might not be the problem, but the semantics within a given field and the uh, what people decide is the very unique component to their metadata versus the one standard everywhere else. Um, they're willing to fight for that very, uh, very strongly. So trying to accommodate all of those from one collection to the next is always the biggest challenge. Um, we also work with consortia, um, just for example, and, and a few others have put up um, aggregations of a lot of content from multiple institutions. Um, this again is material that can be found in, in other places, but by including it here alongside the secondary literature, what we're finding and what we're increasingly um, 
uh, hearing from faculty and librarians that are trying to get this content out, they want to go where the scholars are and for the people who are actually trying to find this material. So if they're trying to reach, or even undergrad or graduate students or community college students, whatever it might be, that are looking for research on a particular topic or um, related material to that uh, article that they've been sent on their syllabus, to be able to host the related uh, secondary and primary source material together is something that they very much want to do. Um, we have roughly 20 million or so um, pieces of content, uh, mostly print uh, material, but an increasing number, millions at this point, of images and additional documents that are provided through our secondary sources. Um, Art Store Digital Library currently still has a separate website because, again, it was um, you, separate from JSTOR for a very long time. All of that material is now also replicated on uh, JSTOR and trying to build teaching tools that satisfy both the uh, visual resource community as well as the uh, print first scholars has always been a bit of a challenge and we're trying to work on that right now actually as well. I mentioned Global Plants was another initiative where working with a lot of uh, herbaria and botanists and uh, scholars around the world trying to get all of that material online with their own metadata formats um, was also a, a long and, and complicated project but something worth taking a look especially if you have material that doesn't quite fit any of these other categories. And Portico was something that I thought worth mentioning as well. Um, it's a dark archive and in the sense that um, only becomes active uh, for a contributing institution or if a publisher were to go away. So this is uh, for small uh, run uh, or even larger publishers um, that don't necessarily, uh, the institution that subscribes to that article or to that journal doesn't necessarily believe that they'll be around as long as the institution. Um, this was a way for them to have an, a, a bit of an insurance policy that that material won't go away uh, when that publisher changes or changes hands or the terms might change and they still want to have access to the past material. Um, this is a place where we store a lot of that uh, material kind of as a just in case for those scholarly institutions that want to make sure they have uh, long term access to that material. And we work with a lot of national digital libraries um, to kind of do this long term uh, preservation in case the economic landscape changes in the sector. Um, and yeah, I'm sure there's going to be plenty more to talk about. Thank you, Peter. Now I'll hand it over to Virginia. Um, hi, everyone. It's amazing that we're all here together to talk about digital asset management. It's really fun to nerd out with such esteemed colleagues here. So um, I'm representing kind of a, a, a new kid on the block um, in, within the open knowledge movement. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen and go through some slides that I have ready for you. And if I can move this, let's see. Are you able to see my full screen? Great, thanks, Neil. So um, we, like I said, we're new kids on the block uh, to this large ecosystem that is the open knowledge movements, plural. They, they're, they are um, sort of a wild breed of all kinds of disparate projects kind of with this very similar goal of making knowledge free and open and easily available. And um, with all of these incredible projects comes this need that we identified to curate all of this material that exists. So when millions and millions of things exist, how do you find the thing that you need and how do you provide context for those things? So um, we, are, we work within the cultural heritage sector. So arts and culture is our home base. So we are mostly focused on the open glam um, context of the open knowledge movement. Um, but we are also an open educational resource. Our mission is very education oriented. So we really do sit at this intersection of glam institutions, legal tools, open access, OER, and the general free knowledge movement. So our value proposition for this, why curate this material is that curation provides context for what you find. So if you come upon an object in an archive and there's very little context or really messy metadata, I think both um, Alexis and Peter gave great examples of how the big challenges associated with metadata. So if you come across a work and it has really opaque metadata and that's all you get, 
how do you understand what this object is? How do you know, how do you, what's the context for it? Where's the meaning? Curation also tells really enriching stories. So the curators do the research, they figure out what is this thing and where did it come from and what was happening around the same time period and they tell you a story about it. The other really valuable thing with curation is that it helps people find the right stuff. So if you are a researcher and you have been in archives, you know the frustration, especially with messy metadata. It makes it really hard to find hours and hours of research to find the thing that you're looking for. So I'm here representing Curationist. And what is Curationist? Curationist is a platform for curating art and artifacts that are available publicly through open access licensing. So we have honed in very specifically on the open access movement. Everything that you find on our site will have a Creative Commons uh, license with it, CC0, CC, um, CC BY, or public domain mark. So that narrows down some of our materials. So we are not everything. We are starting with something very specific. Oh, I should mention that we are a nonprofit project of the MHZ Foundation. So um, we are also, like the other projects, um, a nonprofit. So I'll walk you through a little past, present, future, and hopefully get you excited about what's on the way. So in 2019, we launched our proof of concept website. That's currently what's still live on the internet. Um, and we used, we've used these years to do a lot of discovery around what digital materials were even available for curation, what was the value that we could really bring, um, and how can how how do we sort how do we parse out this messy ecosystem and find the place where we really add value within it? So it was the seed of an idea that was planted in 2019. Our presently, we're, we have a we're very near the finish line of our work in progress on our custom database and web application. Uh, so this is where we figured out what our problems were in terms of being able to aggregate this data so that we could then create uh, curation tools that you could easily search through and find things. Um, and we're just we're putting the final touches on our UI and it will be launching this year, which I'm very excited about. We are also have a growing content and community teams. That means we have a growing team of internal cura curators that are working with our material and with our system to tell stories. And we also have a new community team that will be building community around this as we launch. So our idea is really beginning to take root here. Our future is that it's a full web app for reimagining culture. Our whole goal is to give culture, put culture in the hands of internet users for their reimagining. It's um, no longer the need of just exclusive gatekeeping, but what happens when the community really has tools with which to curate and engage with and create these cross institutional encounters with open access art. So um, the, it'll, this idea will hopefully be healthy and growing um, in, into the future. So I wanna talk a little bit about the value of curating digital cultural heritage specifically. Uh, so it helps, find, it helps people find materials that they can use and put to good use. So this discoverability is a huge piece of what we are offering. And I should say discoverability cross institutionally. So you can go to each institution and find what you need, but um, possibly, but we are pulling lots of institutions together so that, <clears throat> so that there's um, a cross pollination between collections going on. So the other value of curating digital cultural heritage is education. So cultural liter literacy, digital literacy, visual, visual literacy. <clears throat> and here goes my voice right on cue. Um, and then also comprehension. So once we're able, once we're curating, we can do things like translate, um, translate titles so, and translate metadata so that people can find it across different languages. We can update and redress historical records as needed. And expertise comes in many forms, citizen and community, scholarly, and also specialist knowledge. Um, <clears throat> so we can collect all these forms of knowledge <coughs> excuse me, um, in order to increase an audience's comprehension of the materials. So storytelling is a big thing for a curationist. And I'll give you an example of an article that's currently live on the site 
um, about, it's called Westward, The Course of Empire Takes Its Way, How a Monument, Monument to Manifest Destiny Became Enshrined in the U.S. Capitol Building. It's written by Anuranda, Anuranda Vikram, Anuranda Vikram, excuse me. So we published, we, Anu had been working on this story for months, um, and we happened to publish it right around the time of uh, January 6th, which uh, was a, it was an unfortunate kind of confluence of time that this happened, but it was an interest for us, it was a really great example of how the historical really is relevant for the present moment and contemporary times. And within her piece, she describes how this um, major monument to Manifest Destiny ended up in the halls of the Capitol. And she provides context to it around the time of the Morrill Act, the Homestead Act, as well as the beginning of the US Civil War. So um, instead of finding just that image on, in, from the Smithsonian Archive with a little bit of metadata, she really is able to pull out what, what's important about this and why is it possibly strange that this is still there um, or not strange that it's still there. So I'll talk just briefly about metadata. It's also incredibly important to this project for discoverability and access and context and all of that. And I just wanna say that our big goal here is that we will be incorporating the source metadata that comes from all of the institutions, but ameliorating it or just growing it naturally through some layered metadata on top. So we're not hiding anything or erasing anything. We're just adding additional context. And, and um, some of that can be updating terms that maybe um, a big use case that we've seen is some dated terms to describe people. So we'll be updating some terms the way to describe human beings in some of the catalogs. And um, also working with local context to um, start assigning TK and BC notices to some of the works for traditional knowledge that exists in these collections that need um, expertise, specialized expertise from indigenous communities to label properly. We're also incorporating Wikidata QIDs, um, and we're doing this in several different ways, some manual, some semi-automated, um, but it, all of this is so that we will be able to eventually complete this sort of circular digital solution that we are working on, where um, our database, the creationist database, ingests all of the open access collections data, as, and it also incorporates our layers of metadata, and that, database feeds our website but it's also got a gateway and people can take what take the data uh, to use for themselves so the museums if they're interested in the layers and incorporating that themselves back in they're welcome to if they want to do a sort of a data project they're welcome to so it's a really um, circular system we're taking from the commons and we are returning back to the commons um, so that was, I, I was going to show you that slide didn't load. I think it's, um, it's a video prototype that is a little too big. So I'm not able to show you where we're going, but um, maybe during q and I can fix this and pull something up for you. But here's just some handles and an email address if you wanna learn more and be in touch. Thank you, all three of you, that was incredible. Um, we don't have any questions right just at the moment, but while we wait, Neil and I put together a few. Um, why don't we start with, um, you mentioned, so a couple of you did mention messy data being a big challenge for cultural institutions. Um, what are some other things that cultural institutions should think about as they're digitizing their collections and wanting to work with, you know, say one of your organizations to make their collections more accessible? Um, as they're, they're getting ready to dive into that. And this is for all three of you. Uh, from my part, you, the accessible point there is perfect. Um, the, there's hardly ever any alt text um, that comes along with the material. So even if it's um, in addition to curator notes or some sort of description field, which could be as terse or as poetic as anyone thinks is appropriate. There's hardly ever anything that's just a pure visual description that could be useful for someone in any number of ways. Um, that's just a, a great place to start. Um, even simple tagging in keywords that could be used as alt text, something to that effect. Because um, even if it isn't um, trying to address a, a, a cited community or whatever, that 
that information is always helpful in various contexts down the chain and in sorting and filtering and all sorts of other places. So the more um, they they can think about accessibility for all of the audiences and the potential uses of that material, um, I think the better. Uh, from my perspective, one of the things that we see a lot of issues with is um, people who are doing larger um, larger output files, like if they're digitizing movies and things like that. Um, uh, people often don't have, this is, a, it, this is like a bread and butter kind of thing, but I think it doesn't occur to people. If you want to uh, get that stuff from your institution to my institution, how, how good is your bandwidth? How long is it going to take? right, to actually upload that stuff. It's one of the things that we ran into with the California Revealed project. Um, they were doing a lot of movies and getting things uploaded was taking forever. So one of the things that uh, we offered and that they took advantage of was they actually came to our offices and uh, would work from there, like just bring a hard drive. And we're, we're on fiber, so uh, for, from here, it's very, very fast. Um, and from there, it might not be. So um, getting, figuring out how you're gonna move those files around um, is actually something I think a lot of people don't realize they're gonna have to figure out. <laughs> In terms of um, preparing data, I think that um, my, my answer is kind of funny. It's don't be scared to put your data into the public to help you clean it up. Um, I think that it's a Sisyphusian task. So let people help you is, would be my, don't be, don't wait till your metadata is perfect. Um, put an open access license on it so that people can help you. Yeah, that's a great point. I don't wait until anything is perfect. It's never going to be perfect. And whatever plan you come up with is not going to survive contact with actually doing the project. So just start. That's, that is my biggest thing. Start, do two of them and see what you learn and then do 10 of them and see what you learn and then do a hundred and see what you learn. And then you might have a, maybe, maybe you'll have a totally workable plan after you've done a hundred or a thousand. Um, but we, we scan a thousand books a day and we still find things that we need to change in our process. Um, I think that uh, probably the other thing I would say that I, I probably should have mentioned is is that idea of like when you are digitizing things, figuring out what that pipeline looks like and how you're gonna track things through it um, and make sure you always know where something is, what state it's in, um, you know, where the physical item is stored, you know, versus the digital item, all of that kind of stuff are things that I think um, might not be obvious until you start the project and you get a thousand in and you're like, oh gee, I forgot to do X. Um, so those, those are all, uh, that pipeline work, I think, is also very important. Plan for updates, too. Um, the, the number of times that people just think it's like a set it and forget it thing where they upload it and they never come back to it. But then, oh, yeah, either there's a typo or <laughs> they just, you know, something as simple as that or a more dramatic and, and, and appropriate change to the metadata. And there's no bulk way of doing it or there's no way of identifying what records also have that problem or whatever. So um, that sort of change management. Um, something else that needs to get when dealing with um, lots of copies keep stuff safe getting those copies out of sync um, kind of freaks people out so making sure that you can kind of keep those um, knowing what state everything is in and all the places you've given it would be really cool Peter I'd like to start a question uh, with you um, and for all of you what do you think are some of the biggest obstacles to building a successful partnership relationship with the, are they technical? Are they policy? Are they people? And how do you overcome those? How do you uh, bring people to the table and, and get that relationship working successfully? I don't think it's been a technical issue for the last 15 years. I think it's a it's a policy thing in almost all cases. Like, And even then, it was, um, depending on the size of the organization you're working with and so on, it, it could be just bandwidth. Um, like the, the people are you might be an organization of 50 and you're coming to an organization of three or vice versa. And there's just so much time that has to be spent on, on those policy decisions. The legal component um, is the one we, we almost always run into where there's the rights around the content that's being put up online. Um, whether the publishers or in past lives, whether it's been 
uh, artists or the institution not feeling comfortable putting up on a line, not knowing ultimately what's going to be done with that material um, and things like Creative Commons licenses or so on. I, it was one of um, a Creative Commons presentation where they said that the most diverse metadata fields that they've ever seen, and I think this is probably consistent across all of our experiences, are the legal fields where there's the most verbiage in that field. The rest of the record could have like one or two words, but the legal field goes on forever. And it's never the same across one record to the next, even within the same collection or whatever. So um, trying to parse all that, and that's really been the, the biggest issue. It's never, but we can get past the metadata formats and semantic stuff and this and that, but the, the policy and the legal stuff seems to be the biggest holdup. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, it, usually it's not, uh, the policy stuff is usually within the, the institution itself, not between us. Um, usually if people have like, oh, well, we really only want to stream these things instead of make them downloadable or something, we usually have ways to answer those questions that I can just answer the question, right? I, it, either it's a, yes, we can do that, or you're asking me to do something I can't do or whatever. Like it's usually pretty cut and dried. Um, but yeah, it is usually those, those intra, you know, internal institutional, uh, policy questions. I strangely, I have kind of a weird answer for this. I think, um, because a lot of what my team does is we just do it for free. Um, sometimes I think that we run into things with institutions where they don't quite know what to do with that. <laughs> I think we're, we're very used to, um, paying people to do something. And we have our processes set up for that, right? Like, okay, and mm -hmm. then I take the contract to legal and then I do blah, blah, blah. And when I say like, no, I'll just do it for free. Here's, here's how you do it. Let me, you know what I mean? It, sometimes I run into an issue uh, with people with that where they're like, okay, but don't I have to do it? No, you don't. <laughs> nope, they're expecting, they're expecting more process than, than, than is required yeah. to uh, accomplish the goal. Yeah, which is kind of, is kind of an interesting problem to have, um, yeah. but it, it really is that easy. Um, I mean, when we do have things that we're doing for money, like digitizing books or uh, whatever, there's kind of standard contracts and there's a standard process to go through with that. But when it's just the free stuff that sometimes throws people for a loop, I've found. No, that's really true. <laughs> I mean, when we started seeing more of open access institutions in the United States, like with the Met and the Cleveland Museum and others, people, in some cases, they really couldn't believe it. You're like, no, you're giving it to us for free. It's like, yes. Yes, yes, we are. <laughs> so there's that uh, curve of disbelief that comes and then you start to see the usage pick up with community engagement. Virginia, that might be a good way for you addressing this. Yeah, I was gonna say, so we benefit from, we wouldn't be possible without open access policy at all. It wouldn't be, and I sort of see what we're doing as a little, as like an, as a really nice, in a, like, um, it's not really an innovation. I guess it sort of is because we're, we just wouldn't be possible without it. So we're a small team, we're a small nonprofit. It makes it so that your collections as an institution can have a life beyond what you can imagine it can have. And it really helps you fulfill your mission by expanding audience. Because if someone takes it and turns it into something magical or something that really communicates with, some, with a community, then suddenly you're reaching a community that you've never reached before. And as a, as, as a small nonprofit, we couldn't, we don't have the bandwidth to deal with the, like all of the relationships and negotiations and we're just tiny, we couldn't do it. And we couldn't be nimble and lean in order to try to figure out how to add value. So um, I think that it's benefits that that policy, I, I mean, I agree with Peter, it's 100% it's policy for the larger institutions. For us, we're really interested in, in, rep, in also having access to smaller institutions. And so for them, the problem is resources. They are interested in open access, but they are small like we are and have nobody that can do it, you know? So um, it depends on kind of what you're talking about in terms of what's in the way, who are you talking about? If for large institutions, totally policy because I was at this. I was at this lecture a few weeks ago with some museum directors, very prominent museum directors, who had not um, done open access but had a lot of public domain works in their collections. And somebody in the audience had asked them what what they were doing with their data and whether they were going to make their data public. And they all three were just sort of like, "No way! We understand that our data has value, 
but we don't know what it is yet. So no one can have it. That was their response. It was this really kind of like territorial, like so we hear that data is important and valuable. We haven't figured out how to monetize that for ourselves yet. So we're going to keep it nice and tight to our, to ourselves. And I thought that was really interesting because it really limits their ability to um, reach new audiences. So I think that speaks to the, the, the point of leadership and leadership and vision and how it's really important um, throughout an organization to have people that are working at certain levels of an organization, whether they be more tactical or department heads, but also your executive team and board thinking about these things and these relationships too. And something I've encountered in the past is it can be sometimes difficult for a leadership team to understand why they should partner with somebody else. So it's like, well, if we already have our own website, why do we need to put this material somewhere else? Or we have our own projects to do. We're too busy for that. And part of, I think, the important thing that is as valuable as represented by your organizations is, is the community and the access benefits that you get and the engagement benefits. And that's very exciting. Like, for example, Alexis showed on the archives page how you can see the impact right there. You can see those metrics and analytics right there. And I know, Peter, you offer that um, with Earthstore and JSTOR as well. But that measurable impact, uh, I'm, I'm sure Creationist will wow us someday with its metrics as well. Um, to be able to show that in real time to people and say, look at the number of impressions, the number of people that have been using these materials, uh, so key. Alex or Nick, do you have another question? I am. I wanted to say something oh, sure. real quick about that because we we have run into that issue before as well. It tends to be less with institutions. Um, institutions aren't necessarily trying to figure out how to make money off of their their stuff, but um, we do have uh, like major collectors of things. Sometimes want to store things with us, and that is a huge concern for them. You know, like I've spent my whole life doing this. I get money from people licensing this to use in documentaries, et cetera. The Prelinger collection on the archive is like the best example of this, kind of our classic example. Um, Rick Prelinger is a film archivist. He has digitized and put thousands of things up and, and put them in the public domain. And people still pay him to license the, the stuff because they want to know for sure that they can use that in their documentary right they want the receipt from you know getty or whatever that says nope I, I paid for it you know what i mean so even though he has put things on the archive that you can freely download that has an open um license on it he he still gets paid uh by professional people who want to use those resources and i think having examples like that that you can use to to show people that doing this that open sourcing or you know opening things up is not going to hurt their business model um and in fact will bring more attention to them um and get more people to use their things is really important like it the philosophically it is great but to be able to show someone a real uh real world example that it it absolutely does not hurt you to do this um is i think incredibly useful I'd be interested if you have any advice, uh, Virginia. You you made a comment um, earlier about you know the perception of you know data. I think you know largely folks on the on the call are you know they're the choir you know and they're trying to figure out so how do we deal with our leadership to move the things forward that we need to move forward. And yes, you you make a good point, Alexis, about pointing out you know here are here are some sex success stories. Um, but do you have any more kind of advice for, you know, someone kind of in, in the middle of an organization passionate about, you know, asset management, metadata, you know, releasing collections information that, you know, all that kind of stuff. How, how do you really convince your leadership, you know, amongst, I guess, all the priorities that are happening right now that this is an important um, and much needed initiative that has long term consequences for the the organization, which oftentimes leadership are too short sighted to see. Well, I think there's some really within the open glam world, there's great success examples that have been well documented. So um, uh, I bet Neil has them all uh, has all of those bookmarked, but um, th that's that's the ammo that you need. So analyze, do an analysis of these reports about the success stories, and the success stories are people that never had been to the museum before are now going to the museum because they found the work online and they were able to see it. Um, 
uh, Wikipedia alone may, uh, makes uh, the numbers on, of people viewing works is astounding. And so that's all well documented. So if you are the enthusiast in your organization, um, you will wow your executives by studying these reports and producing an, an analysis and make it easy for them. Put it in a slide deck, um, you know, synthesize and uh, synthesize the data and make it really easy and compelling and then build allies in, in peer, in, amongst your peers. So maybe before you go straight to the executive team, look at your peers, see who else is interested and wants to be part of this mission with you. And then maybe go the next level if you have someone above and get them really the buy-in. So it's a long game, I think, but it will really pay off and it will, um, you will also shine at your institution. You will really help the institution. So I think it's well worth it. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's feasible in your current roles, but that's probably how I would approach it. Just to piggyback on Virginia's response. One of the things if you're thinking about the organizations that are represented here, it's just crazy, stupid math. And what I mean by that specifically is, and I'll use the example of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, since 2017, over a billion people with a B have connected with the Mets collections because of them being on Wikimedia Commons. And if you take that in aggregate with the Internet Archive, with JSTOR and Ithaca, you build up an incredible, robust portfolio of engagement that completely overwhelms anything like physical attendance. And especially in the times we've been living in with public health and safety, with COVID, these ongoing challenges, these are resources that need to be in the hands of teachers, of parents, of um, community leaders, of religious communities. They need to be available and part of people's lives and experiences. And these are the kinds of platforms right here that can help you do that. It's just so clear. We've had success with an economic argument too, depending on the size of the institution and who they are with universities and museums and libraries within universities. So um, in many cases, there's a faculty archive or some passion project that um, the librarian uh, AUL is supposed to maintain that archive for the next, for however long. So that means they have to hire IT staff, they have to farm out X, Y, and Z to be able to sustain an IT department within the library department, which has to work, you know, in and amongst the rest of the ID services across campuses and all the rest of it, or put it up on JSTOR, put it up on the archive, you know, and you don't necessarily, not that you won't have to have that same staff to support it. And it's not a cost cutting measure per se, but it is definitely something, a long-term maintenance play or, trying to think about, well, I don't need to develop a microsite for that. I don't need to do, you know, the, the digitization for that component. So trying to make that argument, um, depending on how pragmatic and how realistic you could be around budgets and forecasting for the next few years, it can, that's been something that's worked with us. This is what I get for sending all my questions to you ahead of time because you have answered all of them and I am blown away. Um, so I'm just gonna leave it to you, Neil and Nick, if you guys have any questions um, before we wrap it up. Sure, maybe as a, as a point of departure and also a point of beginning a journey for somebody on the call today. Oh, if you were gonna give them one piece of advice to how to start building that relationship, building that, that conversation internally, um, what, would you, what would be the first thing you tell someone to do if they're enthusiastic about what they learned today? Maybe we'll go with Alexis first. Yeah, I kind of feel like Virginia really covered it. Um, I, I do think it is a matter of just starting. Um, as I said earlier, we, uh, we build things up in our heads to be a lot harder than they really are. And I, you literally just go to the Internet Archive, click the upload button, type in a few fields, drag a, <laughs> drag a file in there, click go, and, and you started. Like, that's it. You're, you started. So if you have any, anything, any digital files or anything like that, that, that you want to share with the world, um, upload five of them, and then you can show them to the people uh, at your organization and say, look, I already did it, right? They're right here. You can click play. 30 people have already looked at them since, you know, a week ago. Um, it's, just start doing it. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe ask for forgiveness later. I don't know. 
but it, it really doesn't have to be as hard as, as I think you're probably making it up to be in your head. That's great advice, Alexis. Peter, what would you, what would you say? Uh, just that you're probably not the only one uh, thinking about it or dealing with it, that either if you're going to find another example or you'll find uh, some, if, if you're trying to convince someone that you'll find a peer institution who's already doing it. This isn't, the landscape is very different than it was 15, 20 years ago where everybody was just getting started. There's no shortage of good examples and increasingly, hopefully we'll see more and more storytelling around the content. Now, the aggregators uh, don't necessarily have to do all the work and bring that, that content together. Now the context is being provided by a growing community and that's really where the value I think is going to be moving forward. So trying to figure out where you can put your voice uh, into that broader uh, organizational community, I think is the biggest thing. Awesome. Virginia? Um, make friends. Um, don't do it alone. Build a, build a crew. Everybody needs a crew to be successful. So, um, you know, build a crew that is on this mission with you. I would um, also say, you know, Peter and Alexis are great people to reach out to if you, once you know what you want to do. So is, so are Neil and Nick, you know, um, there's a community and they're very open. So um, yeah, like Peter said, you're not alone. And like Alexis said, just do it, just start it and, and build influence gradually with the crew. Fantastic. Embrace your inner Nike motto. <laughs> Just do it. I love it. All right. Um, well, do we have any more questions? Neil, Nick? Good. Oh, this was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I was Thank reminded you so much. As, you, as you were talking about the Internet Archive of a slightly scary visit to the um, church to see the porcelain figures, which was. It, was it me personally who scared you with them? Or was it just the. <laughs> it was you personally, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that it is was... one of my favorite things to do is to like take unsuspecting people upstairs um, and not warn them about the right. statues. <laughs> and for anyone who's in the audience who doesn't know what we're talking about, good, you should come visit the archive. <laughs> yeah. It, it is like a, a seriously scary B movie where you walk into a room and there's just these kind of small models of real people and. Don't ruin it Nick. <laughs> hashtag spoiler yeah <laughs> apologize unreservedly can, and, can we um edit that out of the recording <laughs> strike and one more thing just to mention while we have everyone here um the partnerships and relationships it's about the long tail um so you're going to see the relationships improve over time you're going to see the content scale the engagement scale over time so don't be too impatient with the results you know it take it takes times for those clicks to happen so um, have have confidence in in the relationships and the analytics and the numbers will go up uh, and then you'll find those those next platforms yes thank you again the three of you for participating in our webinar series i think i can speak for nick neil and i and, and say that we are so thrilled to be able to be promoting your organizations and the work that you do because of just how incredible it is and how great it is for the field in general. Um, thank you for everyone attending and listening to the recording. We will be back for another episode of Dan Related Topics soon. Please follow us on social media or sign up for our newsletter if you'd like to be kept informed of future webinars. I wish everyone a wonderful rest of their week and we will see you next time. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye.